All right, class. Welcome to lecture one for Tuesday, thirtieth June. All right, so this is the graph that I was talking about in the last class. All right, so some of these conclusion that we came to based on this data from this graph, all right, is basically as the temperature increased, all right, have you see the precision x axis? As the temperature increases, the vapor pressure of all these gases, it doesn't matter whether it's diethyl ether or it is bromine, but you see that as the temperature increases, the vapor pressure increases as well, right? So for example, if we look at ethylene glycol, the antifreeze, look at that. As the temperature increased, right, the vapor pressure did increase as well. A couple of things to keep in mind. The increase is not linear, right? Whenever I say linear, I mean by let's say if we have something on y-axis and something on x-axis, if the increase is something like this, then we say that the increase is linear. But here, if you look at the graph, it is a non-linear increase. All right, so I hope this makes sense. Another something that you should have noticed, <coughs> all right, is we said that if you look at the point right here for all these different liquids, these point right here, these are the boiling points of all these liquids. That means, let's see if we find water, which is going to be my blue right here. Okay, that's exactly at 100 degrees Celsius. If I find for mercury, almost, not surprising, right? Mercury is a liquid at room temperature, a very, very viscous liquid. Look at its boiling point, almost like 350 or something degrees Celsius. Now, what I'm telling you is basically, we said that the liquid with the lowest boiling point has the highest vapor pressure all right so that means diethyl ether has the lowest boiling point that means it should have the highest vapor pressure and not surprising right because if you think about this vapor is pressure is kind of the pressure that is exerted by the vapor right so that's why higher the vapor pressure the lower the boiling point and this mercury has the highest boiling point and thus lowest vapor pressure. All right. And what I said was about this line, really, really important. Because remember, the boiling point of liquids are different at different pressure, right? Does this ring a bell? Because I saw this data in the last class, right? And then if you look at this, look at this external atmospheric pressure. As the pressure increased, the boiling point of water increased as well, all right? But at one ATM, Right here, this is the 180 ohm pressure or 760 millimeter at G. It's the same thing, millimeter of mercury. We consider that the normal boiling point. So think about that as more like a room temperature, right? We're probably around that 180 ohm pressure in West Virginia. Maybe a little bit less, but then again, think about water both 
roughly around 100 degrees Celsius in West Virginia. But then if you go to, let's say, Mount Everest, all right, the Mount Everest, the atmospheric pressure is 240 millimeter Hg. Since the atmospheric pressure or the external pressure is less, means the boiling point is going to be less as well. Right, so these are some of the things that I wanted to glean out of this graph right here. All right, and you remember the y axis is talking about the vapor pressure of each liquid and temperature, the x axis is the temperature in degrees Celsius. All right. Now we said, okay, there is a relationship between the vapor pressure and the temperature, right? And we said that as the vapor pressure sorry as the temperature increases the vapor pressure increases as well but then we use the term non linearly now what did Clausius Clapeyron did was established a relationship between the vapor pressure of the liquid versus the temperature all right where p is the vapor pressure of the liquid and t is the temperature right? and something to keep in mind here the temperature is in kelvin all right so now let's look at this relationship right that means if you look at this and then if i'm able to write this equation in the form y equals to mx plus again this is my expectations that you took the prerequisite knowledge on alex and you understand what is the equation of this line right equation of straight line and what do all these terms mean all right so remember c is called the y intercept m is called the slope of the line and y and x are the values of points in the y-axis and x-axis respectively all right so now if y equals mx plus c is the equation of a straight line all right so what's this so this can be written in the same form right where ln p is going to be my y y equals to m x plus c that means if i draw a graph where in my y axis i have the natural log of vapor pressure and in my x axis if i have one divided by t All right, so I hope this is making sense as to how I got those variables. Remember, what's this, right? So basically, this right here, that's my y equals to m is going to be my slope of the line. And we'll talk more about this, which is going to be minus delta h of vaporization divided by r. And x is going to be 1 divided by temperature. That's why I put 1 divided by t in my x axis. And then plus c. c is basically the y intercept. So that means if I'm able to plot this graph and then plot the points of ln of vapor pressure versus one by t. And if I'm able to draw the straight line, because remember y equals mx plus c is a straight line, right? The equation for a straight line, guess what? The equation, sorry, the slope of this is equals to negative delta h vape divided by r will be the slope of the line. Now, since r is the constant with this value, that means, look at that, you can find the value of delta h by vaporization, right? And we'll talk about what these terms are, but I hope this is kind of making sense because we'll be using, make sure if you are not comfortable with the equation of the line and then using equation like this and then manipulating it in this form, 
make sure you are comfortable with it because whenever I start talking about kinetics, right, first order, second order, third order, the integrated rate law, we will be using a lot of this concept. Why it goes to MX plus C, what goes in the slope, what's the y-axis, what's the y-intercept, and such. All right. So now, again, like you see, you see that clausius clapeyron equation shows the relationship between nonlinear relationship between the vapor pressure of a liquid and temperature. Now you might be like, oh, but then isn't this linear? But remember, to make it linear, I changed that vapor pressure and took the natural log of the vapor pressure and then took the inverse of the temperature to make that a straight line. All right. But then if you just had, let's say, pressure, vapor pressure versus temperature, what we saw earlier slide, it is a nonlinear relationship, not a linear relationship. All right. So now let us define all these terms. All right. So P is the vapor pressure. And then where you, you see this term LN, just remember that's a natural log. Right. So you have log, which has a base of 10. And if you're comfortable with this, make sure you get comfortable with this concept. Let me, let me write it down here. Natural log, which has a base of 10, right? Whereas natural, sorry, log has a base of 10, natural log LN has a base of E. All right. And that's the E that you see in the calculator, right? And if you want to know the value of E, what you can do is in the calculator, just go to your e to the power just put in one you'll see this e will have a value of 2.718 so think about natural log as the base of 2.718 all right so i hope this makes sense now if sorry i do have to talk about delta h of vaporization now all right so now my delta h of vaporization is basically let's say if i have remember we're talking about this liquid and the paper pressure that the liquid has right so if i have the liquid going to gas right let's say if i have some liquid i start heating it up so that i am vaporizing all that liquid to gas so you can just think about liquid water all right and then from chem 115 what you've learned is something called this term delta h Right, and the way we define delta H is the amount of energy you have to the system has to absorb or release right during this process. So now this process liquid to going to gas, this process we define that as vaporization, right? And that's why this process we define that as delta H of vaporization. In other words, the energy required to convert liquid to gas, or in other words, the enthalpy, or the change in enthalpy to change liquid in the gas is called the delta H of vaporization. Right, so I hope this makes sense. All right. And then R is again, it's the same R that we used in PV equals to NRT for K115, right? So R is a gas constant. And one of the values that you can use for R is 8.31 joules per mole Kelvin. Now you might be wondering why was the temperature in, in Kelvin? Because this K right here is in Kelvin so that all the units match up, that's why the temperature is in Kelvin. All right. And finally, the C is the y intercept. That means if I draw the graph of L and P versus 1 divided by T, and if I get a straight line, right, this right here, that's my C value, right? That means from here to here, that will be called my y intercept. and my C value, all right? Now, what 
can we use this clausius Clapeyron equation for one of the most important part, right? So if we take the vapor pressure of the same liquid, let's say we're just talking about liquid water, all right? And if I'm able to find the vapor pressure at two temperatures for liquid water, so let's say one temperature was T1, and I measured the vapor pressure P1. And I took another temperature, right, at a higher temperature, let's just say that. And I measured the P2, or the vapor pressure at T2, right? Then I plot a graph. And then this will hold true, right? So now this formula came from this formula. From Clausius Clapeyron, so you can think about this formula as the extension of Clausius Clapeyron equation. All right, so again, remember one thing to keep in mind: some of the books they do not have the negative sign here. But having said that, they do have the negative sign here because they might have manipulated either the P1 and P2 position or T2 or T1 position. But if you are using this formula. One thing to be very, very careful about is this negative sign is present here in this formula. And whenever you have P2 here in the numerator, the T2 has to be the first term here. All right, so make sure you use this formula and stick to it. Don't get confused. Do not change this to ln P1 over P2 because it will screw everything up. All right, so I hope this makes sense. And again, stick to this formula and use this formula to answer these questions. Now, that's little, let's do that, right? Let's just apply this formula and see what kind of problems that we can solve. All right, so this question is kind of similar to uh, what you will find on Alex. All right, so what that given me is you have a liquid, liquid mercury at is liquid mercury right and remember mercury is one of the few elements in the periodic table beside bromine that is liquid at room temperature all right so chemist what she did was she measured the vapor pressure of liquid hydrogen sorry liquid mercury at four pressure temperatures right so this is my first temperature this is my second temperature this was her third temperature, sorry, this was her fourth temperature. And at that four temperature, she measured, measured the vapor pressure of liquid mercury. Now the question is asking me from this data if I can calculate the enthalpy of vaporization or delta H of vaporization of mercury. Right, so I'm gonna do it, since I'll be needing lots of space to solve this problem, I'm gonna use my whiteboard. I can get out. I'm just trying to get out. Come on. All right. So again, make sure you have this screen open as I'm working through this. All right. All right. So let me write down everything I have. All right. So what I'm going to do is. I'm going to take these two as my temperatures. So T1 and T2. All right. To solve this problem. So, based on that, what I get is my T1. Thank you. So my T1 is 80.0 degrees Celsius. My T2 is 100 degrees Celsius. Now you might be wondering, can you take any of these? Yes, you can take any of these, but again, to kind of make your answer make your life miserable but then again to kind of create a knowledge check in the next slide 
what you're going to realize is the delta H vaporization of mercury is going to be different for some other two temperatures. And which shouldn't be the case. But having said that, all I'm saying is like this is the same process that you can use to solve any of these problems. All right. Whenever you have been given vapor pressure at various temperatures, you can take any two data points is what I'm trying to tell you. All right. So at T1, my vapor pressure was has to be P1, all right? So make sure these two line up. Whenever you have T1, it has to go along with P1. So my vapor pressure at that temperature is 0 All right, so let us uh, yeah, change that tour to ATM uh, because I'm all right. So basically, what I'm telling you is let us assume I should have taken note of that. All right, let's assume this tour right here. I'm gonna change that to all to ATM because I'm not gonna do the conversion for right now make your life miserable. I should have thought about this earlier, but then again, let us assume these are all in ATM. Let me exit. Ah. All right, so I'm going to erase this. Let us assume this right here is in ATM. And my paper pressure two at temperature two is going to be zero point two seven two nine. All right, so now I'm gonna write my equation down. My equation formula tells me ln of P two divided by P one equals to negative of delta. H of vaporization divided by R one divided by T two here again. Make sure you watch out for this. All right. So T two, this has to be T two minus one divided by T one. So if it's P one here, this has to be T one here. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to plug in my values here. All right. So Ln of my vapor pressure 2 is 0.2729. All right. Never mind. I don't think it would have mattered even if I had to use Tor. All right. All right. P1 is 0 0.0888 ATM. Again, uh, I'm sorry. It wouldn't have mattered uh, if the unit was in torque because I was concerned about the using the R value of 8.314. It doesn't matter because the tour and tour would have canceled there anyways. All right, so I do not know my delta H vaporization value. I'm just going to leave it as it is, divided by now my R value. I'm going to use it as 8.314 joules. Per mole times Kelvin. 
Now you might be wondering why my temperature has to be in Kelvin so I can, can cancel out this Kelvin with my temperature here in Kelvin, all right? That's why the first thing that I'm going to do is I'm going to convert this temperature to Kelvin, all right? So my 80 degrees Celsius in Kelvin is going to be, now uh, this might be some kind of review for you guys. Remember, to convert a temperature to Kelvin, all you do is you take that number, 80 degree, and you add 273.15. So my T1 is going to be 353.15 Kelvin. All right, where my T2 in Kelvin is going to be 100 plus 273.15, which is equals to 373.15. One five Kelvin, and then all I have to do is I plug in my values. One divided by T two is going to be three hundred seventy three point one five Kelvin minus one divided by three hundred fifty three point one five Kelvin. So what I was telling you earlier is right. Basically, whenever you do the maths for this part. In the end, what's going to happen is this Kelvin is going to get canceled with Kelvin and Kelvin, right? Here, the ATM, ATM is in the numerator. This is in the numerator. They're dividing. That's why you can cancel these units out. So if you, in the end, what's going to happen is you're going to be left with this unit called joules per mole. Not surprising, right? Because even in 115, we learned about the enthalpy change, right? There's the H supposed to have units in joules or kilojoules per mole. All right, so now all I have to do is do my math here. So whenever I divide these two numbers and I take the natural log of this, I'm gonna get the value 1.1227, all right, equals to, Let's do the H vaporization divided by 8.314. And then if I do the math here, right, I take 1 divided by 370.15 and then subtract it from minus 1 divided by 350.15. What I'm going to get, this is really important, is minus 0 0.0000. .00 5177. Now, this is where I'm telling you all these minuses signs and plus signs are really, really important. Do you see how there's a minus sign here? Right? Now, what happens whenever we do 1 divided by T2 minus 1 divided by T1 is we are going to get a negative number. And what you've learned in maths is whenever you multiply a negative number with a negative number, you get a positive number. And that's why in the end, your delta H vaporization is going to be a positive number. And I hope this makes sense, right? All I have to do is I have to multiply both sides by 8.314 and then divide both sides by negative 0 0.00015177, right? So in the end, my delta H vape is going to be, right down here, my delta H vape is going to be 61501.8 joules per mole. Now, Alex will probably ask your answer in kilojoules per mole. If it asks you in that, all you have to do is divide by 1,000 to change this joules per mole to kilojoules per mole. And it's asking me to report my answer to 366, right? So in the end, my final answer is 61.5 kilojoules per mole. All right, so I hope this makes sense. A little bit of math, not that bad, all right? Now, for your knowledge check, what I want you to do, all right, is I've said that in the previous slide, I used 80.0 and 100.0 degrees Celsius at the two temperatures, right? 
That means I had used these two temperatures. And then these two paper pressure. But for your work, what I want you to do is you want, I want you to find the delta H of vaporization, but then use the 120 and 140 degrees Celsius. All right. Now again, I want you to use these two values. All right. Yes, your answer could be or should be, it's up to you, pretty close to the value that I calculated for the earlier 8 degrees Celsius and 100 degrees Celsius. But I changed the number here so that the answer is slightly different so that you get a practice. All right. But again, the concept is all you have to do is you follow the same formula, ln P2 divided by P1, negative delta H divided by R, 1 divided by T2 minus T1, and then watch out for the units. R is supposed to be in 8.314 joules per mole Kelvin. All right, do not forget to convert the degree Celsius to Kelvin before you work on this problem. All right, so this is your knowledge take three. So let's move on now. The other Alex question. Right. So the reason I am doing this problem is this kind of uh, tricky one. And that's why I'm doing this problem for you all. All right. So and then it does involve you using something called exponentiating both sides. All right. And then I'm going to show you how it's done or how we can do it in the calculator. That's why I plan to work on this problem. All right. So now. The enthalpy of vaporization of substance X is 8.00 kilojoules per mole, right? So that means they have given me the delta H of vaporization. And its normal boiling point is 116 point. That means just trying to show the 360 here with this decimal here. So it's asking me to calculate the vapor pressure of that same liquid X at negative 79 degrees Celsius. All right, so something to keep in mind. And so what I had said in Boiling point happens whenever the vapor pressure equals the external pressure. All right, so keep that in mind, because that is going to be really important when I solve this problem. All right, so make sure you have this problem opening on the screen, because I'm going to use the whiteboard that I have to solve this problem. All right, so for my problem, this problem, I'm gonna clear my canvas. All right, now I'm gonna write down what has been given to me, okay? In any kind of problems like this, the first thing like you should do is read the question and then try to collect or organize your data so that you know what the question has provided you and what you need to find. All right, so it has given me that I'm just going to use P2, T2, and then P1 and T1. All right, that way I'm going to put down what do I know about this because remember my formula tells me my formula is LN divided by P2 divided by P1, right, and so on. All right, so now let's just assume since the question asked me to calculate the barrier pressure of X at negative 79 degrees Celsius. So I'm going to call that T2, my temperature of negative 79 degrees Celsius as T2. And it doesn't matter if you can to take, if you want to take that as T1, that's probably fine as well. It won't matter as well. There's just a simple math that you have to do and be careful about, but it doesn't matter if you want to take that negative 7 degrees Celsius as T1 and the other temperature as T2, it's probably fine, all right? So when your T2 is 79 degrees Celsius, I'm going to go ahead and save some time and I'm going to change that degree Celsius to Kelvin. Remember, because I need my temperature in Kelvin, right? So to change this to Kelvin, I just do this. That's why my T2 is going to be uh, 194.15 Kelvin. 
whereas my T1 is going to be, it says it's, its normal boiling point is 116 degrees Celsius. So that's my first temperature T1. So I'm going to convert that to Kelvin, and I'm going to get my T1S, 100, ah, 16 plus that, I'll get 389.15 Kelvin. All right, so now, T2 is something that I don't know, right? Because it's asking me to calculate the barrier pressure of X at 79 degrees Celsius. So this is my 79 degrees Celsius. That means I do not know what's my P2 value. Now, this is where things get a little bit crazy. Now the question is, do I know my P1 value or not? Right? Because they haven't told me, oh, the barrier pressure at 160 degrees Celsius was this. They haven't told me, but what do I know? Right, if you go back five slides that I've pointed out, right, when the vapor pressure equals the external pressure, so that should give you a hint that this P1 has to be one atm, right? Because remember, that's the external pressure where the vapor pressure will equal to this one atm. Because the question said, and it's normal boiling point. Normal boiling point is always at 1 atm. All right. So I hope this makes sense. Now, let me find my, the question has given the delta H vaporization, right? So they have told me that delta H of vaporization, the amount of energy it requires to convert the liquid to its gaseous form at normal pressure is 8.00 kilojoules per mole. Now remember, in my formula, my R has the units of joules per mole. That's why the first thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna convert this to joules per mole. And I know that one kilojoule has 1,000 joule. That means based on that, I'm gonna have 8,000 joules per mole. And again, here I'm not worrying about sig figs right now, all right? Because if I have to really worry about sig figs, there were one, oh no. One, two, three sig figs here. Uh, but again, I'm not gonna, because the question is probably in the end gonna ask me to put an answer to two or three sig figs. And then that's what we're gonna worry about in the end, all right? But then all I did was converted that 8.00 kilos per mole to joules per mole. Now I have my formula, right? Lm P2 divided by P1 equals to negative delta enthalpy of vaporization divided by R and 1 divided by, again, very, very careful, T2 minus 1 divided by T1. Now all I do is plug in my values, right? And then yet by my P2 is something that I do not know. So I'm just gonna leave it that as P2. My P1 is 180 M. All right. My delta H of vibration is, again, do not forget this negative sign. 8,000 joules per mole and my r is going to be 8.314 joules per mole kelvin and then one divided by t2 is 194.15 minus one divided by 389.15 Kelvin. 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 So now, what is going to happen in the end, all right, is basically what's this? What's how the units cancel out, right? My joules and joules are going to get canceled out. My mole and mole gets gonna, are going to get canceled out. 
and my Kelvin and Kelvin, whenever I subtract all these, right, my Kelvin and Kelvin will subtract out in the end. What I'll be left with is this unit of ATM, right? And then the question did ask me, calculate the vapor pressure of X at negative 70 degrees Celsius, and not surprisingly, one of the units for vapor pressure is ATM. All right, now, this is where I have to be, I want you to be, watch out for what I did here, and the math, all right? So now, whenever I do the math, this is what's gonna look like. Right, I have my calculator open here, so I can show you and make sure you have your calculator open in front of you as well. All right. All right. Now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to because since I know all this this part, so I'm just going to go ahead and solve all this. And what I'm going to get is probably fill up that. Okay, let me go ahead and double check this math so that because I changed things a little bit here and there. Uh, so whenever I do all that, I'm gonna get All right, so my right hand side is going to look something like this ln p2 divided by 1 atm equals to 2.48. But I'm just going to get my negative 2.483. And that negative is going to be really, really, really important. All right. Now let me show you what how to work this out, right? So let's say whenever you have been given this, what we're going to do is something called exponentiate both sides. The term that we need is, and I will tell you how it's done in the calculator. Exponentiate both sides so when you exponentiate both sides what happens is this natural log disappears all right and all you are left with with this term p2 divided by 1 atm and if you took the calculus course or if you are taking it you're going to know why because again the idea is we are taking e to the power of all this and when that happens the e and ln of e gets cancelled that's why we are left with p to the power 1 atm and this is the most important part right since we exponentiated both sides this is what's gonna happen to my right hand side when you exponentiate both sides now that your calculator should have this feature right in your calculator there's something called e to the power x so what i do is i Press that button e to the power x, right? And for that x value, I'm gonna put in negative 2.483. And it is really important that you put the negative 2.483, not positive. All right. Whenever you put in negative 2.483, what you get is p2 divided by 1 atm is going to be 0, 0.0. 834. And if I multiply both sides by 1 atm, my final answer is going to be 0 0.083. Since the answer wants me to have the answer in two sig figs, since the negative 79 degrees Celsius, right? This has only two sig figs, and that's why this dictated my everything in the end. All right. And I think Alex just tells you calculate the answer in two sig fix something because I think I have taken off the sig fix option if I'm mistaken. All right, so final answer is this ATM. So I hope this makes it again. There is a series of math, and this is a part you might not have done before, right? The one I'm just gonna show it in blue. 
which is the part you might not have done before, but make sure you are comfortable because for your formula type of questions in an exam, right, this is something you might have to do. I mean, yes, if you saw all this work at least, right, you're gonna get at least 50% credit, right, 50% points, but then to get to the correct answer as this, you'll need to know how to exponentiate both sides. All right, so I hope this makes sense. All right, so now, so we talked about, uh, I used the term delta H of vaporization. Right. Now let's talk about more about other things because delta H vaporization only focuses on when a liquid converts to a vapor. But what about other forms of changes of matter, right? So let's say if I change something to solid to liquid, or let's say from solid to gas right what are they called and is the energy or is the change endothermic or exothermic is what we're going to talk about right so that means we're talking about the changes of phase right. so now the first thing whenever i'm talking about change of phase i'm probably talking about one of these right solid liquid going to liquid liquid going to gas or solid going to gas or even you could even talk about the other right where you could literally go from liquid to solid and from gas to solid as well as well as from gas to liquid all right now let us understand all this so first thing it's really important right any transition, remember what you might have learned in high school is a solid is much more ordered, right? Solid is much more ordered. Or in other term, the molecules in solid are much more ordered like here. This is a ice, which is a solid phase of matter. This is water liquid and this is water gas. So what you see in these is the solid is much more ordered than liquid which is much more ordered than gas so that means whenever you go from a more ordered to what's less ordered state all right you always have to put in energy right that means in other words think about it to change a solid ice to liquid water i have to heat it up that means i input some energy and that's why going from either solid to liquid or from going from liquid to gas or from solid to gas all these processes right here these are all endothermic processes all right now let us name these terms right so what is the process called so we've learned earlier liquid going to gas it's called vaporization all right now a solid going to liquid we're going to define that process as fusion all right so all i'm doing here is using these terms that they used here fusion vaporization all right and finally a solid going to gas is called sublimation all right so i hope this is making sense a liquid going to solid it's called deposition oh, sorry a liquid going to solid all right it's called freezing right here all right because we said oh a liquid water freezes into solid ice right a gas going to solid is called deposition right here and a gas going to liquid it's called 
condensation. Now, for all these processes, for all these processes, since we are going from a less ordered state to a more ordered state, right? So think about this. We're going from either from gas to liquid or gas to solid or from liquid to gas, right? In all these three cases, we're going from a more, sorry, less order state to more order state. And for all these energies always released, for all these processes, that's why. For those processes, it, they are exothermic in nature. That means they release energy, right? And look at all that, right? Any endothermic processes, what you've learned in K115 is that delta X is a positive value, right? And look at this. This is a positive value. This is a positive value. This is a positive value. Whereas for every exothermic processes, these processes are all exothermic. Look at that delta X fusion. Get rid of just zero, less than zero, less than zero. So I hope this is, again, take some time, pause the video and take some time to internalize it. All right. Now, what do we call is, remember we said that delta H vaporization, we name this amount of energy to change this liquid to gas. And we use the term delta H vaporization for this process. And we can do the same for, all of this process, right? So solid going to liquid, I'm gonna use the term amount of energy required to convert this. I'm gonna call this delta X of fusion. Whereas for the third one, solid going to gas, I'm gonna use the term delta X of sublimation, all right? And then we're not gonna worry about, uh, I'm not gonna give problems for your exam which involves this, all right? But again, I do want you to make sure you know these terms, deposition, condensation and freezing and know that all these processes are exothermic in nature all right so anything on the right these are all exothermic in nature anything on the left these are all endothermic in nature all right lots going on in this all right, but again, take your time, make sure you understand all this graph. All right, and finally, most of the important part is understand this, right? Sublimation is going from solid to gas. So I have solid here and gas here. To go from solid to gas, if I calculate the delta H of sublimation, that has to be the sum of delta H of fusion plus delta H of Vaporization. All right, now one last slide. All right, and then I will end the lecture one. And again, these are the same term, right? So fusion means solid going to liquid. So keep that in mind. Vaporization means liquid going to gas. And sublimation means solid going to gas. So the amount of energy required to bring about the changes, right? So if you're talking about this, I'm talking about delta H of fusion. If I'm talking about liquid going to vapor, I'm talking about delta H of vaporization. And finally, if I'm talking about solid going to gas, I'm talking about energy required to convert this solid direct to gas is called the enthalpy of sublimation. And finally, this last table, and I'll stop it, All right? So, what I want to learn from this table is basically kind of look at some of these values, right? And then look at whether they are positive or negative. If you look at delta H of fusion, what we have said is since delta H of fusion or fusion or vaporization, these are all endothermic processes, right? And that's why look at these values. These are all positive values. All right. And here are some values for the fusion, how much energy is required for the fusion for some of these substances, right? So if you look at nitrogen, 
you only require 0 0.71 kilojoules per mole. Not surprising, right? Because nitrogen is literally already a gas at room temperature. All right. And the delta S preparation for nitrogen is kind of less as well. But if you go up to water, right, look at that. But delta S fusion is a little higher. Delta S preparation is higher as well. Now, instead of that, if you think about delta H of vaporization for some kind of a solid, let's say sodium is a solid, sodium is a solid at room temperature, right? That means to convert that sodium, the sodium solid to liquid, right? For this one, you're trying to convert the ice to water vapor. Right for this one, you're doing the same thing, right? Sodium, sodium, which is liquid already, you're trying to convert that to sodium that is gas, right? And it's telling me that oh, much more energy to convert sodium liquid to sodium gas than water ice to water vapor, right? That's what it's telling you. All right, and finally, this is what your knowledge check four is going to ask you. It's going to ask you what is the difference between these terms, fusion, condensation, and vaporization. All right, so make sure you know all these terms. And the question here asks you in the previous slide, whenever I say previous slide, I'm talking about this slide. Uh, well, from this slide, it's asking you from this table, which substance has the highest and the lowest enthalpy of fusion all right so i've given the choice nitrogen carbon tetrachloride sodium fluoride and water look that up in this table all the values have been given to you the enthalpy of fusion values all you have to do is find out which one has the lowest and which one has the highest enthalpy of fusion so i'm going to end here at the enthalpy of fusion slide all right and then i will put up the lecture too soon